grace and peace to all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. My name is Reverend Laura Sherwood. I am the interim associate pastor here at First Presbyterian Church of Wilmette. And I extend a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us for this virtual worship on this, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Today, we welcome two guests in our service, pastors, friends, and colleagues from North Minster Presbyterian Church in Evanston. Reverend Jessica Gregory will be one of our pastoral liturgists today, and Reverend Michael Kirby will give the sermon and lead us in the benediction. We thank them for sharing their worship leadership with us. And if you are new to our faith community, or if you're joining us here for the very first time, first, we want you to know how welcome you are. And if you are new like me and you would like to learn more about the ministries and programs that continue even during this virtual time, I invite you to visit our website at fpcw.org or visit our Facebook page, First Presbyterian Church of Wilmette, and if you're so inclined to like us while you're there. And lastly, if you have a moment and if you haven't already, any time that during the time that you're watching this service on our YouTube channel, if you would take just an extra moment to click the subscribe button, and that will help us to continue to grow our online community and to grow in our outreach. And if you find today's service to be particularly meaningful and feel it would be meaningful for someone you know, a friend, a neighbor, a family member, please feel free to share the link with them and know that our love goes with it. And now I invite us to center our hearts, minds, and spirits for worship together. Please join with me in the responsive call to worship. Christ is calling you as disciples. Lord Jesus, let us follow you faithfully. You will be led into fields of mission and service. Lord Jesus, where you lead us, we will go. Listen for Christ's call to you. We are ready to serve the Lord. Amen. Lord, you have come to the calls us to repent and draw near to him, to share the realm of God and the peace that passes all understanding. Together, let us make our confession, first in a time of silent personal prayer.
Now let us all pray together. Holy Fountain of Forgiveness, the tale of Jonah reminds us of your never-ending love for all creation. May we be like the people of Nineveh, who are able to acknowledge their sin and open their eyes to your healing presence. Though you stand ready to forgive our sin, we find it easier to bite our tongues, clench our fists, and cling to our hurts and resentments, rather than let you open our hearts. We trust you, Holy One. We pour our, out our hearts to you. Receive the pain that lurks in our humanity as we offer up what we have hidden from ourselves and from the world, those words and deeds that keep us separated from your love. When we repent, our God relents, lifting us beyond the pain, restoring us to safety, protecting us in the refuge of eternal love. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I have several announcements to highlight for our common life today. Some items from the youth group. The Tower Alumni Millennial Edition Gathering is meeting this Tuesday, February 2nd at 6 p.m. There is a Tower Parent Meeting next Sunday, February 7th at 11 a.m to talk about the year's plans up to and including the summer work trip. Both of these gatherings will be held on Zoom and the links are included in the Saturday email. Today, January 31st, is the beginning of events planned and sponsored by our Racial Justice Task Force. Today, Sunday the 31st, if you see this in time, we invite you to gather with us outdoors at 1 p.m. at the corner of 9th and Greenleaf, where we have just installed a banner that states, Black Lives Matter to God and to us. We will hold a brief worship service, socially distanced and masked, to honor this installation that represents a long-term commitment of our congregation to racial justice. Tomorrow is the first day of February and kicks off our Racial Justice Challenge Month. You will receive an email every Monday with a week's worth of materials and links that will help us grow in our awareness and education about racial justice issues and to learn about specific actions we can take. To help us start out this month of racial justice awareness, we are very excited to welcome a special speaker to our adult faith formation class next Sunday, February 7th. Tracy McKeithen, Executive Director of Family Promise, will talk about the relationship with our church and how they show faith, hope, love, and witness to the people they serve. The class is held from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. on Zoom, and we would love for you to join us. 
And now let us share the peace of Christ with each other virtually and with the people who may be sitting with you right now, saying, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Friends, our first reading for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Hear now the word of our Lord. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent! and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed them, followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the hymn book of the Hebrew people, from the Psalter, today from Psalm 62. Listen for a word from God, beginning at the fifth verse. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from the Lord, who alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in Yahweh at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before the Lord. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together, lighter than breath. But put no confidence in exhortation and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Katrina is a successful business owner in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. She's also a remarkable athlete. She has always pushed herself to succeed and tries to shrug off disappointments or minor injuries that her running or workouts might cause. In 2018, after each of her upper body workouts, she began to feel more sore than typical she congratulated herself on pushing her limits more than she had thought she had. She was in the midst of marathon training and she had done a full half marathon training run the weekend before and now every day she was doing additional strength training and pushing herself extra hard. The soreness persisted, but she pushed on. As she was finishing her workout on the third day of this upper body discomfort, a trainer she barely knew pulled her aside, concerned about swelling in one of her upper arms. Had she pulled a muscle, he asked. She had not. The trainer encouraged her to get it checked out, seemed very concerned. She shrugged it off and said she would hydrate and she would be fine. But later in the day, the swelling was worse. And so instead of shrugging it off this time, she trusted in his advice and went to the doctor. 
Within a few minutes after his initial tests, she was hooked up to an IV diagnosed with rhabdoilysis, a buildup of toxins in the blood from overuse that causes kidney failure and can cause death. Her doctors assured her that even one more day of exercise or one more delay in seeking treatment of one day could have cost her her life. She trusted her trainer and she had a full recovery. Robert is a retired police officer. Bob and Laura were married in 1958. They were one of those childless couples that everyone seemed to admire, a, a real team who lived their lives to the hilt. They loved to travel and have adventures with one another. They filled their home with photos of those adventures, their smiling and life-brimmed faces peering out with joy and excitement in every room. On Valentine's Day 2014, after receiving what appeared to be a devastating diagnosis following the visit to a doctor with what she thought was bronchitis, possibly becoming pneumonia, Laura was checked into the hospital and it was confirmed she had advanced stage four lung cancer with pneumonia on top of it. After five grueling months of treatment, Robert entered their home truly alone for the first time in 56 years. She wouldn't be with him there ever again. And now the faces staring back at him brought enormous pain and loss. How could he possibly keep living when the one who seemed to be half of his life for most of his life was now gone? People tried to be helpful, but their words, though well intended, seemed cruel to him. You'll eventually find a new normal, they would promise him. And perhaps God has another person for you someday. He didn't want a new normal. He wanted the old normal. And he certainly didn't want anyone else. He was haunted by what he perceived to be his failure to protect her, the love of his life. After all, that was his job for over 40 years, protecting people. But he couldn't protect her. Eventually, at the end of his rope, Robert agreed to participate in a grief class. Even though his faith had been sorely tested, broken even, he thought, by Laura's death, he went. And the facilitator there encouraged him to rest and to pray. Even if the prayers were just telling God how unhappy he was or how mad he was, creating that space for quiet, creating that space for communication with God, creating the opportunity to ultimately rest in the presence of God, ultimately began to open Robert back up, to open him up to trusting that God could be with him, even without Laura. He would never, will never, stop missing the love of his life, but he began to see when he trusted that he was not alone, that he literally wasn't, that he had friends and extended family that he could turn to, and he had a rock that he could cling to. The God who had made him, the God whose love had built their relationship, and suddenly, the world wasn't spinning quite as out of control as it had been. Robert is now a facilitator for that grief group. He still misses Laura all the time, but he is living each day, finding purpose each day. He will say, because he ultimately learned again, to trust in God. Now, I'm willing to bet that as many of us heard those two stories, both stories of trusting, the trust that was perhaps the hardest to understand for many of us 
might have been the second story. Katrina's trusting her trainer was based on science and knowledge and his experience and saved her life. Robert's finding a way to trust God again. He said it saved his life, but what was it based on? For that matter, what was the trust of those disciples based on to leave families when called up by a virtual stranger in the gospel passage that Jessica read? Why would they do that? Why would Robert trust in God if he had experienced God's absence so strongly in Laura's death? Katrina was invited to trust in the recommendation of one who was supposed to know. Robert was invited to trust by one who had been where he was before. Robert's facilitator had been through her own grief story, her own loss, her own experience of finding a place to trust in God in the midst of great loss and uncertainty and sadness and even anger. But she could speak of the power of that trust to create healing with as much or more actual experience as Katrina's trainer had about her condition. Psalm 62 is a Robert story psalm. It begins with someone sharing an experience of their own experience of God's presence. All of that me language, language of personal reliance and experience, my soul, my hope, my rock, my salvation. And only then after establishing those credentials does it open things wider. God is a refuge for us. Let us trust in Yahweh. Psalm 62 is testimony of the call of the rock, the one dependable. Robert testifies to the call of the rock, one he can experience as a rock even though his own life has moments in it when he experiences great tragedy and loss of even a part of himself. Psalm 62 doesn't promise that things will be perfect. It doesn't promise more loss won't come. It doesn't promise that the loss that has been or the pain that has been is going to go away. It says that God will be there no matter what comes. The call of the rock is the reminder that people will disappoint. Circumstances will disappoint. Wealth, as it says, will disappoint. Prestige will disappoint. Perhaps even one's expectations about God will be disappointed, but God will still be there, we are promised. Okay. Decent theological explanation, decent Sunday school lesson, Pastor, but so what? What does this mean for us? right now. Let's see. A pandemic with 400,000 deaths and a projection of 100,000 more in the next four to five weeks. A vaccine rollout that's slower than anyone wants while the virus is mutating at the same time. Millions unemployed, tens of thousands of small businesses on the brink or actually failed or failing. Political division still deep in the early days of tentative cooperation of a new administration, international tensions rearing their heads again, racial inequity and institutionalized racism posing challenges that confound many and have confounded us for four centuries, parents entering a ninth month at least of having to balance work, family life and schooling all in the same place, frequently at the same time, with competing and exhausting agendas. How could we know about life spinning out of control? Robert says he finally committed to trusting God in the process of his grief when he realized that alone he couldn't do it. He needed those friends and neighbors and family, and underneath it all, he needed a foundation, a rock. He needed God. He needed to trust in God. Maybe 
Maybe even as we marshal our best and our brightest, as we gird our loins for the journey to the, what lies ahead, to our best efforts and the best people into engaging the challenges that we're all facing, internally, locally, nationally, and globally, maybe as we hope for and work toward the end of this utterly unnormal time, perhaps, perhaps it is also a time for us to acknowledge again as the recently inaugurated president who has known his own share of loss acknowledged this week that we cannot do this alone. We cannot make it through any of this, let alone all of this, alone. We need one another, yes, all of us, but we also need a rock. We need to let go of placing ultimate trust in anything other than, I want to suggest, the mother of time, the father of grace, the child of Mary. This confusing, mysterious yes that defies every no the universe can come up with. This is the rock we are invited again to commit ourselves to, to find a way to trust. How do we do that? Well, if the Gospel of Mark is any example, one thing we can do is follow. Follow the example, follow the teachings, the self-offering hospitality, the grace of Jesus. Surrendering our annual marvel at his breaking into the world as an infant and seeing that in his ministry as an adult, he broke down barriers with a love that disdained status and earthly power, or even having to be right or having to win every argument. And if Robert and millions more like him who have been through the crucible of life, lost pain and disappointment, and come out the other side, changed, but whole are any example. In, the, in addition to following, we are invited to try to rest and to pray. Creating space in our lives for listening, for renewing, for Sabbath, for just being, and also creating a space for encounters with the divine, in prayer, in the study of scripture perhaps, in conversations with one another, in service. All of these are prayers enacted, after all. All of these are ways of exercising the muscles of our faith, of our trust rehearsing the ways we can stand firmly on the rock of God's love and grace or cling to it when the world seems to slip out from under us. Perhaps that is the call of the rock, to follow, to rest, and to pray, creating space to see God at work in us and in others, to trust that we can make it through, not back to normal, perhaps not even toward a new normal, but to days when whatever comes, we can rest assured, we can know, we can be confident that God will be there with us. In tangible ways, like in the support of friends or family, in intangible ways, like the warming of Robert's heart now, when he can go into that house and look at those photos again, despite lingering loss, and experience joyful thanksgiving for the time he had with Laura. Friends, together let's explore in these coming days and weeks and months, and yes, even for all the days we have left in this life, the possibilities, the hope, the comfort of trusting in the one who gives us life and purpose and meaning. When you stop and think about it, that life and purpose and meaning, aren't they together the love song that is the call of the rock?
Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow together in a time of prayer. Spirit of the living God, you have created us for yourself. You have called us into being, and you have offered us your love. Hear us now as we pray for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. Christ, who gives us courage, increase our faith that we may trust in you. May we move forward knowing that you are beside us and before us. Strengthen us in our witness in this congregation to the importance of racial justice and our commitment to learn, listen, and work so that all may know true justice and equality. God of wisdom, teach us to love the world with your love. Guide all leaders, strengthen the good, and lead us all in ways of peace. We remember all who are fearful for the future, for those who are facing more violence, more hunger, more poverty, and more despair. Work through us to bring lasting relief and enduring hope. Lord of mercy, we remember and pray for those among us, those known to us, and those known only to you who are struggling this day, for those who are battling sickness or disease, those who are facing surgery or who are weighed down by grief. We remember those whom we name now in this moment of silence. We offer all our prayers to you, Lord God, with hope and faith, and we continue to pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are invited to participate in the kingdom emerging all around us, to receive the promised Holy Spirit and the invitation to walk in newness of life. May we respond this morning with glad and generous hearts, freely giving our tithes and offerings to the ministry of this congregation. In lieu of passing the plate, we offer four ways to make your offering. Use our church website, our smartphone app, text the word Wilmette to the number 77977, or send a check by mail to the church office. As we gather our gifts together and offer them to God, may we do so in gratitude and praise. Let us pray. Holy God, steadfast rock of all salvation, we marvel at the strength of your compassion and your ability to offer forgiveness. We come to you, hungry to be part of the good news you are bringing forth, for we would be part of the realm you are revealing. Amen. So we prepare, prepare to leave a time of worship to enter a life that is worshipful, a life where in each moment we are invited to claim, to trust, to rest in the love and grace of God, no matter what comes, and to be a source of that grace and love, a reminder of it in how we encounter one another how we are with and for one another. For as we go out into the world to live, to encounter all that is, we know that we do not go alone, but in the company of the God who made us, in the companionship of the Spirit who journeys with us, and in that closeness as close as breath of the Christ who says, Follow me. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs> 